parlors. Uh, but we're part of the Fluke group now as of two years ago. So uh, Fluke and Ops is everywhere else in the world. So, uh, Is there a bit of a back chat on the microphone or? Okay. No problem. <laughs> I think that's better. Yeah, perfect, thanks. Um, so we'd have about 4,000 customers um, across 55 countries, a renewal rate of above 90%. So our customers would typically sign up to a 12 month subscription agreement. And we currently have over 90% that would uh, renew year on year. Um, and we've been around for just over 30 years now. Um, so in terms of our client base, really small to large across all industries. Um, in the fleet space, we, fleet space, we have some big customers such as Brinks. But really, I suppose the email, it's a very configurable software, so we can really tailor it to suit your kind of workflows and requirements. Um, and that usually comes as part of the implementation that we do that. Um, I suppose your typical uh, maintenance management software workflow would look a bit like this. So you've got your preventive maintenance, either on a calendar or meter based. Uh, preloaded with any relevant checklists, who it's assigned to, task list. And then that would automatically generate based off of a, a reading from a piece of equipment or a truck, for example, uh, or the date in the calendar, generates into a work order, and then assigned out to the relevant in house technician or third party contractor to complete. Um, they then enter in any of the relevant parts, labor charges, close out the work on potentially a mobile device, and then you've got a full audit trail of all the work that's been done. And then on the, for corrective maintenance, so either work orders can be created on the main system from one of your administrators, or anyone can submit a work request, so log in a fault to the piece of equipment or a truck, uh, which then can be approved into a work order by your administrator, and that could be closed out by the relevant person. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah 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 it would be an integration so just be exactly so just be sharing the data probably through an api an open api <clears throat> yeah uh yeah so absolutely we, we've done that before um and as we're part of fluke we're integrating that anyway with kind of fluke sensors and and uh, devices so yeah no issue there um and then with assets, you can manage any costs, anything, any documentation, work order history, schedules, anything like that. They can all be managed on your, your various different trucks, vehicles, and equipment. And then you'd have your, you can have your spare parts management. So you'll have your reorder, reorder points, reorder quantities, buyers you purchase from, and then uh, purchasing and requisitioning. So you can set up approval groups, approval levels um, based on typically cost uh, as part of the, the purchasing process. Perfect. Uh, and then on the implementation sites, we, we offer we offer a full implementation service from start to finish, from project kickoff call to go live. Um, there might be some on-site training as well. But the implementation would involve, first of all, us helping you get your, your data onto the system, uh, and then configuring the system to your need. Um, and then it, uh, on the technical side, so any additional support you need around technical services, so our development team is based here in Dublin, and they can assist with any, as you mentioned, like an integration with sensors, we can assist with that. Any on-site training that's required for end user training, we can provide that as well. Uh, and anything additional from a consulting perspective, we can assist with. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. So from I guess for regarding integrations. So if you need, so some companies do the integration themselves, where we give them all the the information and they can't. Their IT team can, which is, there's no charge for that. But if they need support, typically we're looking in the region of, let's say five to eight grand uh, for a typical. Um, but obviously it requires scope of work that our team will build out based on the requirement for the integration. Um, 
And from a consultant perspective, so any additional on-site consulting or project assistance, um, you know, those are all charged based on a, on a day rate. Um, so I'm happy to provide those as well uh, after the call. Yeah. Um, if you're looking to roll that email across multiple sites, you know, you can, you can have a, what we call multi-site inventory where you can see a part across multiple locations and potentially have that shipped from a different location. Uh, you can have consolidated accounts, basically, where all the different locations would roll up into that account, and you can that account would have visibility over dashboards and reports across multiple sites and uh, that kind of information. And then you can also push it standardized uh, SOP. Standard. <clears throat> These are some of the various different third party uh, applications we've integrated with in the past, but we pretty much integrate with any system. It's just a case of defining what data has been shared between emails and that third party system. Perfect. <clears throat> so just going into the system, so accessible via a web browser. On, on the left-hand side here, I've got my different features and functionality that are relevant to me. Now, anything here that's not relevant, I can, I can change. So if I want to remove a field, if I want to add in a field, I've really got full authority to do that. So this, and this can be done on a user-by-user -user basis. So for example, if I just want to see work orders here on the left-hand side, and I can remove all this additional uh, information and fields. And then, so just touching on my asset hierarchy. So the, I've got my seven different sites, and this number here is showing the number of assets within each of those sites. So let's say I've got 48 within Morrisville, uh, 33 within Elwyn. And as you can see here, this is how I built my asset hierarchy. Now, this can be built any way you want. So it's just a case of adding the relevant columns and inputting them here. So let's say when I drill down to Morrisville, then I can access the buildings. So the 25 assets within my main building. And that will then bring those up. And then drill down a bit deeper to see the floors. And then I can see the 13 assets within my production floor. <clears throat> Uh, and so I've got a, a spread of different assets based on, I guess, the type of assets they are. So I've got a my curing oven, injection mold machine, got my Genbacker engine. So just going into this piece of equipment. So I've uploaded an image. I've also attached a document. So any documentation attachments, they can all be attached via the the uh, document storage. So this is where I can upload attachments, documents, images to your various different assets, work orders, spare parts, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm also capturing just the basic information on this piece of equipment. So what type of asset it is, where it sits. Um, and if I'm looking to see different information, so if I'm looking to track, for example, the depreciation, then I'll be tracking that information here. So you can have as many different types of forms as you want, depending on the type of information that you're looking to track. <clears throat> Every asset and spare part is also equipped with a barcode label, and we also have QR codes. So, for example, if I want to, let's say I want to print this off, attach it to the machine or spare part, and then if I scan that, scan that, um, for example, asset, that will then bring up all that information for that asset on a, uh, a desktop or a mobile device. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can just use like a scanning app, for example, and that would bring up all that information for that piece of equipment. So I can also, if I'm looking to add a work order, if I click that, that will then bring up uh, a correct and maintenance work order, and it's it's brought across numerous different uh, fields and information from the asset record. And this is where I can schedule the date for completion, let's say 3rd of May, how long I expect it to take, and I can assign it to either an in-house technician or a third-party contract. <clears throat> So this will be my list of technicians. I can also define them based on shifts, or it could be an individual. So if I assign this, let's say, Porg, I can add in a task from our task library. So let's say if I'm doing checking a, a tire rotation, that will then bring up a text box. And I can also add in a perform for. So just somebody who wants to be like a manager, wants to be kept in the loop on a particular job. 
And when I save the job, Horik here will receive an email with all the relevant information here attached as a PDF. So this will be your work order. So, and any additional information here around permits to work, documentation, inspections, checklists, they could all be attached here. Parts required, so I can I can attach parts from our our uh, our, our inventory. <clears throat> this is where I can add a spare part. Let's say this bearing, and then I can. I can select a date needed by, so someone on the inventory side can receive that notification saying that if we're low on the spare part, I need it by this date. Yeah, exactly. So, you, yeah, exactly. So, typically, someone on the administrative side, um, but also you can have technicians. If someone's been assigned a job, then they can they can submit. Let's say, if we're low on a certain part, they can submit a requis requisition. Um, so, would you be looking to use email on a mobile device, or would it just be purely on desktop? Yeah, well, just to show you, um, so it is called our technician license. Really, it's designed for technicians to um, kind of easily create, edit, and access and close out work orders. So this works on any smart device, any iPad, tablet, uh, Android, Windows phone, that kind of thing. So here, I can look up information around work, historical work orders, uh, assets, and spare parts. I can check in to see where, what, uh, what stage my requisition is at, so if, if it's been approved yet for a spare part. I can add in meter readings. Um, so if I want to quickly add in a, a reading from a piece of equipment, so I can do that here and just attach the asset, look at parts. But typically, the main area they'd be going to is the work order screen, whereby they can either add work orders, look at which jobs they're currently signed on to, or go into my work orders. These are all the open work orders that are currently open and assigned to me. So I could filter based on priority level, based on the ask description, I can also search, let's say, only high priority jobs. I'll, I'll bring these up. Okay. So go into one of my jobs. So here I'm just tracking the basic information around. I can see here the work order status, the asset. I can sign on and off. So let's say I start the job, I sign on. And then whenever it comes to, let's say, end of the day, I finish the job. And I click sign off, and that will then track the start time and stop time of the job. So you might have like a standard labor charge, which will then automatically associate with that particular job. I can take a picture. I can upload it to the, the work order of the, the asset. I can attach any relevant documentation or look it up. Uh, you can also have in the procedures, so you can have checklists that might look a bit like this, whereby it's a series of tick boxes or pass fail. So if I click fail here for any one of these um, tasks, then a correct maintenance work order will automatically generate. So part of what we call a pass fail checklist. I can also enter comments, readings, and then click save. As well as that, I can add in parts. So if I require a part, I can also add it in. And again, this is where barcode scanning comes in useful. If I just scan a, scan a part, that it'll then automatically be um, associated with this job. So whenever I, th I then finish the job, I go to close out. And this is where I enter in my summary of repair. Does it require follow-up? And if it does, I enter in my notes for creating a follow on work order.
Okay. Um, any questions on the mobile side in terms of functionality or? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what we call a uh, set of workflows. So, workflow manager basically, based on an action or whatever, something happens or a change in something, that you can have whoever you want to receive a notification, like an email or some kind of notification to their their mobile device. Yeah, yeah. So we can set up these kind of predefined workflows during your implementation based on just just so that the right person gets notified based on a certain action or occurrence. So in terms of, um, could you just explain that one again? Just to like... Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for a job, it'd be as simple as, let's say this is an open job. So we have a work order status whereby it could be waiting on a part. So, and then thereby once that part comes into stock, then he he can receive a notification. And so based on whoever's assigned to the relevant part required. So that, as you can see, that status is currently open. So yeah, exactly. So it'd be, Fairly straightforward to set up uh, a notification that he receives once that part is coming to stock, so then he can then go and complete the job. Yeah. Perfect. Um, just going back into the the asset record. Um, so on an asset, we have a um, prevent and maintenance schedule, so we can set up calendar and meter based. Uh, so in this case, we have monthly and uh, weekly, but we can also set up PM schedules based on meter types, it could be based on hours, miles, units, kilometers, whatever it is. And it could be based on a running number or totals. There's a task list to follow. So on the so for this job on the 4th of May, Porg here will receive a notification that uh, this job's just been assigned and then gone completed. Any parts required will be automatically issued. And any addi additional documentation can be attached. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So actually, if I go into a different one of our assets. Yeah, so in our curing oven here, I think I think on this schedule, I have a uh, checklist, a preloaded one. Yeah, so it could be a checklist a bit like this, where it could be a series of checks. Uh, and we also have a permit to work, which will print with the work order. Um, and then on any uh, piece of equipment, we have the parts that are typically used. So for example, if I create a corrective work order on this piece of equipment, then these parts will come up as suggested parts to do the job with. If I go into one of these parts, I can see, so we have a unique item number that is unique to that particular spare part, a description of what the part is. Is it currently stocked? Yes. And as you can see here, 50 is currently on hand and available. And we've also set up reorder points and reorder quantities. So the idea is that once number 50 goes below three, this will be added to the parts reorder list. And six, and six will be the amount to purchase. 
in terms of lead time, so typically it takes seven days to, to receive this from, from our default supplier. Our default supplier is Granger, their supplier part number. <clears throat> we also have a second supplier who we don't typically purchase from, but we can. And if I go to the section that I can see the supplier details. So this spare part is used typically for these assets. We have the quantity. And then I can also see the part history. So this would show me um, any activity with this part in the last year. You can go back further, even though it says 12 months, you can go back as far as you want, really. Um, show us you know, work order numbers, if, it was, if any POs were generated, any, any activity on the spare part, if the physical account was changed. And as well as that, then you can also have a spare part spread across multiple locations. So for example, for this one, of those 50 that are available, we have 37 currently on hand at head office, three in Manchester and 10 in Amsterdam. We have 94 on order for our head office, and they've all, they're all set up with different order quantities and order points. So if I want to purchase more of this item, just go, I can go to purchase. And we can have a PO number automatically generated. And the supplier's details are pre-populated as well as the amount to purchase, which is fixed. Now, typically, like I know you mentioned around requisitioning, so we can set up different approval groups, requisition levels, typically based on some kind of cost. And you can have as many different levels as you want to that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any questions on the, on the spare parts side or the, um, I suppose, the, the purchase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it can be consolidated into one PO. Um, so just going into our some of our PO records. Um, Yeah, so these would be all our different purchase orders. I can see here the current status, if it's been closed out or if it's still open. And so for a PO, it would be from one supplier, so in this case, Button Industrial Contracting, and you just have different light items. So you can have as many different light items as you want. Um, so then this would add up, so based on various different um, different spare parts. So for example, when I'm, when I'm purchasing more of a spare part, let's say this one, if there's an existing PO number I wanted to add it to, I just put that in here. And then, and then that will attach to that existing PO. And so, and in terms of the actual purchase order itself, uh, let's say once I receive the parts, and then this is where I can close it out. Now, this one's already been closed out because we've already received the one part. But um, So basically, if I, if I receive some of the parts, it won't be officially closed out until I receive all of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so typically, like, you might have, I mean, in terms of some of our customers that you do use inventory, they kind of split it out, so they'll have someone specifically managing the inventory side of the system. Um, or in other case, you might just have an, an administrator looking after. But you might want to kind of designate roles uh, based on, uh, I guess then what each person is doing. Um, yeah, yeah, so that, that can all be filled in. Um, so you might have like an ETA, uh, which would just be a field that we'd add in here. Um, so, so any field in the system can be configured. So if I go into my manage forms, this is basically my form designer. If I go into my purchase orders and default view, which is this, I can click edit. So this is where I can add in, remove, or edit any field I want. So what you might have is, let's say you've uh, like an ETA expected date to receive it. And let's say if it's, it's come, it's that you expect to receive by the 30th of April, you haven't received it yet. 
uh, then someone on the purchasing or inventory side can receive that uh, that workflow email or some kind of notification to uh, to contact the supplier again. Or you can have you can have an autom- automatic mail go out to the supplier uh, from the system. Um, so you'd have the supplier's contact details in the contact section. So contacts basically would be anyone receiving notifications from the system or anyone using the system. So you could have that supplier, let's say this this particular company, who received that email saying that um, you know the parts not been received yet, for example, whatever. Um, so you can set those up as well. Yeah, so if you go into a, a spare part, you'll have a section for, so what's currently allocated out to jobs. Um, and in this case, we have 94 that's currently on order for uh, for this location. So yeah, you can have that reflected in. Uh, we're, we're currently waiting on a certain amount. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so so that really kind of forms the implementation, all those little um, configurations um, and workflows that will be set up. Um, that's usually, usually the bulk of the implementation that's done by yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. So that comes back to the, the the current work order status. So basically, what's what's the holdup? Is it waiting for inspection, shutdown, parts? These are all standards, which again can be amended based on whatever your list of, of work order status would be. Um, and then, for example, that could be seen in like a, a dashboard or report, whereby I'm not sure if I have one here specifically going over that, but you can see, let's say current, you know, a current update on you know work open work orders by type. Um, what work is overdue? But basically, it would just be a configured report uh, that we can set up. So, just actually quick touch on the reports. So, with the reports, there's about 50 standard that come with the system, but any report can be um, can be tailored. So, as long as the information data is somewhere in the system, uh, we can pull the report to show that. Um, so, if I go into a report on inventory. So it can be run in a few different formats, graph, instrument, PDF, HTML, CSV. We, we can also set up to automatic generate. So if I want to receive a report on a weekly basis in whatever format I want, I can just implement my email address and receive that, let's say, every Friday, once a month, whatever you want. But uh, it really comes down to the report builder where you can pull, you can edit, and add in different fields to uh, to take the report to see what you want to see. Uh, so yeah, for that particular, let's say, work order status, why there are delays, that would probably be a report showing, you know, work order status um, and, uh, and for open work orders, and, and you'd be able to see a list of, I suppose, the uh, the jobs that are currently delayed by whether it's waiting on a part, waiting on the shutdown, whatever it is. Perfect. Um, and actually, I'm just going to go into a colleague's account to show you a little bit more on the the reporting side. <clears throat> yeah. So really, any report you want to see, you can see it around. I guess scheduled work. So let's say on a month-to-month basis, you can see how much work, how many hours of work are scheduled versus what's available to the, for the teams. We've estimated about 175 hours are available to the team, and month by month, you can see in terms of scheduled maintenance, what's uh, what's the availability like.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah, so it, it would be an online system. Uh, so an inter inter internet connection is required. Now, I could send over kind of the system requirements. Like email takes a very small amount of, um, of internet bandwidth. Um, so it, you wouldn't you wouldn't need a, a any kind of high power connection. Um, so I think it's it, it's it, it's a, it's quite a small. So I could send over a document after, but as long as there's some form of internet connection, that doesn't really matter. The that's fine. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I'll send it over after the call just so that you, you want to kind of get to the base requirements. But it's yeah, email is very very light. Uh, cloud system, so it, it it doesn't require a lot. Nothing needs to be downloaded uh, or installed. It's just accessed via browser. Um, all your data is typically will be can be bulk imported or exported through a kind of a CSV file or Excel. That's kind of a standard. Um, also to show you as well, we have something called the schedulers. This would be like a calendar-based view of all upcoming jobs or corrective jobs for the next day, week, or month. So I can see the monthly view, which is this. I can see the, the weekly. So these are all the weekly jobs. Uh, I can assign jobs here. So let's say open work order is not assigned. I can assign that to Ben for, let's say, today, two hours. And that will come up then. This will be from a kind of a, a scheduling point of view to see what's upcoming for the next uh, day, week, or month. Perfect. One more thing to show as well, we also have what we call the interactive planning. So this is where you can upload a floor plan. So this will just be uploaded again via the, the document storage. And this is where you can pin assets, PM schedules, work orders, or spare parts. Let's say if you want to see my assets. And that brings me straight to the, the asset page. Perfect. Um, so, did you have any questions, or was there anything else that you were looking to see that I haven't shown? Yeah. Yeah, so just to quickly explain, I guess, the different license levels. So you'd have your, let's say, administrator level who can access eMaint on a desktop and mobile. Um, so that'd be kind of your super user. Then you'd have your mobile only user. So really, that's just your, let's say, your technicians who are receiving and closing out work orders on a mobile device. And then your work requesters are people who just log requests, just log faults with equipment. So that's free of charge. There's no additional charge for people that just, you know, they log in and they can just input what the problem is and, and uh, create a request. So there's no charge for uh, work requesters. Um, so typically, you know, yeah, exactly. So you, you have, uh, you wouldn't need a, a huge amount of administrative users. Um, and also requesters, let's say if there's certain people who just want to see certain reports or information, they can just log in via their, the work request functionality. And this is where they can see it's, you know, bits of information. So for example, just to show you what it looks like. So a request to log in would look a bit like this. So this is where they can see their open requests, any reje rejected work requests, 
uh, work request history, and also they can see some tailored reports. So that, that this is all free of charge with the, the software. Great. Um, so yeah, it just depends really how many how many kind of administrative administrative users you require, uh, and then how about how many kind of mobile only in terms of technicians for closed network, and then your uh, your request. Um, so, I mean, I suppose like we can set up them to receive reports. Uh, so, we, in which case, yeah, they wouldn't re require any uh, any uh, any license. So it's just we can set them up to receive those uh, reports for information analysis and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, how many? So, how many users were you were you wondering for um, the administrative level? A different kind of, yeah. Three, yeah, yeah. So, um, and what currency would it be? Sterling or? Euros and dollars. First sterling. Oh, US dollars. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah. So at a ministry level would be one thousand and twenty dollars per year. So for three, um, you'd be looking at three thousand sixty dollars um per year for that. Um and then the the mobile only is uh two hundred and forty dollars per year per per user per year. Um, so I'll send on all those costs after the call in, in terms of the cost for implementation uh, training, um, just so you have the. What's the so how what's the ne the next step in your evaluation from here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, perfect. Um, so I can send over um, some information after the call in terms of a recording of a demo and uh, I guess the, the different features and functionality and email, that kind of thing. Um, is there anything else you need for me at this stage outside of the, the pricing and um, just some general information? Okay, perfect. Um, well, thanks for your time today. I'll, I'll, an email will follow uh, in a little, a little while with just some of that information that we discussed. Um, and yeah, any questions, feel free to come back to me.